I just want to thank Doug for being here. Or Tom, Tom, yeah. I introduced Tom. Uh, uh, thank Tom for being here and traveling uh, yeah. to visit with us. And Good. Take it away, Tom. Yeah, happy to be here. Good. Thanks, everybody, for staying. It's 4.30 on a Friday. I tell you, this is a diehard group. Mm, really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to talk about a variety of things uh, that we're doing, uh, and I hope it all holds together. I'm sort of using this lecture to sort of see if all of this makes sense as a kind of narrative. And uh, just a little bit about me. I mean, I was educated as an architect, worked in architectural firms, um, but I was always uh, impressed by the, the comment that Ilil Saarinen once made, which is that the solution to every problem exists at the next scale up. And so as over my career, I, I've gone from buildings to be interested in cities, so i you know, interested in urban design, and I still teach urban design. Um, but more recently, I've become interested in the systems that give form to cities. And so a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about today is uh, system design. And I want to make the argument that we in the design community have an enormous responsibility and opportunity in this vast area of work for whom, for which there are very few designers and there is an enormous demand, right? So um, let me just start, um, I'll talk about various books, some of which I've written, some of which others have written along the way. This was a book I wrote, uh, I think now three years ago, um, in which I um, made the argument that we in the design community have largely spent our entire history focusing on the goods side of the economy, doing buildings and furniture and all the, the physical stuff that we design, right? Um, uh, however, I argue that the services side of the economy, which is much bigger, is just as designed as the goods side of the economy, and there are very few designers in this entire half of our economy. And uh, so as we think about innovations and in practice, I would make the argument that this whole right side of the screen is uh, you know, open territory for the design community. And there is, an, as I said at the beginning, enormous uh, interest in this. And then overriding all of this uh, is um, what I, I sort of want to talk about today, which is that what are the systems, the rule set, that govern both the goods and the services side of our economy. Uh, the policies, the processes, which I also argue in the book are also designed, many of them really badly designed because they've been designed by policymakers who rarely study the design process. Um, as if some of you heard my comments on the panel, I mean, the, the, the policy community is so rooted in ideology that they're constantly coming in thinking they know the answer before we've asked the question. And, um, and as a result, we have a kind of Rube Goldberg structure of policies that frequently make no sense and are badly designed. And so I would make the argument that we as a design community, again, have a enormous responsibility and opportunity here. So, um, why also, I want to also talk about the economy. Now this also seems maybe an odd thing for somebody who, you know, is architecture, an urban designer, why I'm talking about the economy. Uh, one of the uh, degrees I have is in this maybe some odd sounding field, it's called uh, intellectual history, the history of ideas. I've long been interested in how ideas represent paradigm shifts. That somehow after you hear um, Darwin's idea of evolution, you never quite see the world the same again, right? And one of the reasons I realized that I've been interested in this is I think that that's one of the things we do as designers, is we are really good at paradigm shifting. We're not only good at asking why, but we're good at reframing questions, looking at things from a completely different point of view. And uh, so I actually think that the, the design process uh, and the paradigm shifting needs of the, of the moment we're in, which is I'll talk to, to this evening, that we are in the midst of a lot of paradigm shifting going on, that this, this again is a role for us. And one of those paradigm shifts is the economy. And, and again, we tend to think about the economy not as a design system, but it absolutely is a design system. And it has, well, we get the reception starting early, I guess. <laughs> that was a quick talk, wasn't it? Uh, 
So let me talk about why the old economy no longer is working very well for us, why it's increasingly badly designed, and what the new economy is, and why there's opportunity. So another book I wrote back, I don't know, back I think it was just around 2013, started with a, a chapter I wrote in yet another book about the I-35W bridge collapse in Minneapolis. And as you may remember, this was a, this was a fracture. I guess I do interpretive dance now. This uh, was a fracture critical bridge, uh, which those of us who study structures know that this is a fracture critical structure is a structure that has had all of the redundancy taken out of it so that you stress it beyond a point one gusset plate in this bridge collapsed. And the bridge didn't sag. It didn't go down slowly. It catastrophically fell. Um, and there's a stress pattern uh, on fracture critical systems that I, I wrote this book because I saw that this pattern of, of failure in bridges was also happening in a set of failures going on in our economy. And I made the argument that we actually have not just built a lot of fracture critical bridges, we've built a lot of fracture critical systems especially since World War II in this country. And they are, many of them are vulnerable to collapse, right? And um, one way to think about that is this kind of figure eight diagram that actually comes from biology, from biologists look at how ecosystems thrive and how ecosystems fail. And there's this moment where one um, species in an ecosystem becomes dominant and uh, the ecosystem becomes highly uh, vulnerable to collapse. And ecosystems in, in small patches are constantly going through this figure eight process, and they are constantly reorganizing themselves into a more balanced ecosystem mode. Let me get rid of my pen here. And, um, and so I use this as I started to look for every system that was going through an exponential spike because that bridge that collapsed, if we had had a strain gauge on that bridge, we would have seen that bridge have an exponential spike before it, it collapsed, right? And so, um, and what worried me is I started to find these exponential spikes everywhere. This, for example, is an exponential spike in debt going on in our economy, both public and private debt. We are on an incredibly dramatically increasing curve, as you can see from this. Um, and one of the other things that interested me is that as you look at how ecosystems reorganize themselves, they tend to collapse back to where they were before the spike began. And so there's this tendency to, uh, sometimes economists call it a bubble, that we get a bubble and then it bursts and the system collapses back to where it was. So this is debt. Um, this, I think, is one of the other reasons I started to pay a lot of attention to the economy because as a design system, what it is we are doing is we are stressing our economy. This is called the Gini curve. And this is a curve that basically says how many people have how much wealth. Now, if half the people had half the wealth, it, it would be a 45 degree angle, but it isn't. This gap shows that a very few number of people control an enormous amount of wealth, not only in this country, but in the world, and a vast majority of people have very little wealth. And so, um, essentially, as we become less and less equal, more and more unequal, this curve gets steeper and steeper. In other words, it's another exponential spike. It's another one of those curves. And if my theory, in the, I make the argument, is correct, this is completely unsustainable. This is an economy that will collapse. You cannot have, you, we cannot stress the economy this much with so few people having so much and so many people having so little, right? And so um, uh, uh, that was another reason. And this was just something a little bit more in our wheel. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, this was, um, yep, I lost my, okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, let me go back. There we go. Oh, there we go, back. Okay, let me stop, I'm gonna go around. Yeah, that's a better idea. Otherwise, I'm gonna bring the lectern down, maybe the wall will fall. Okay, uh, this interestingly enough is the uh, price spike and then the collapse of the housing prices uh, during the subprime collapse, right? And look what happened, you know, around 1997, the prices took off. 
um, uh, they, they fell catastrophically. And look at about where they ended up. They ended up back roughly where they started, right? So the bubble burst and the system reorganized itself. But of course, a lot of people were hurt. Now in the book, I, there's a whole chapters on, for example, there's, we're in an exponential spike of carbon accumulation in our atmosphere. We're in an exponential spike of human population on the planet. And so we, I make the argument, have got to reimagine our relationship to each other and to the world because if we keep a stressing systems, stressing the atmosphere, stressing the economy, stressing the planet with too many of us, um, we are making ourselves vulnerable to catastrophic failures. So that was sort of the idea. And some people thought, well, why, why is somebody with your background writing a book like this? And I made the argument that one of the other things that we're good at as designers is seeing patterns. And uh, very few economists talk to ecologists, talk to demographers, and they weren't paying attention to the fact that all of their systems were on these same exponential spikes because they don't talk to each other. And uh, so one of the other roles for us as a design community is to see related patterns and start to make lateral connections among things that others aren't making. So this is sort of the basis for my argument that what we're doing now is not sustainable. We have to reimagine, essentially redesign the economy. Um, so what are some of the new ideas driving um, the, a lot of the thinking behind the new economy? And I'll talk about these um, six books. Um, I could add many others, but these are six that have influenced me a lot in, in my thinking. So the first one um, is this idea of the platform revolution. And this is a really interesting argument, which is to say that every organization that is a gatekeeper, where there's asymmetry of knowledge and a demand for that knowledge, is vulnerable to being replaced by platforms. Now think about what a profession is, or think about what a university is, right? We all, you know, I work at a university. Universities brag about how hard it is to get in, right? And there's an asymmetry of knowledge. Professors have knowledge, students don't. And there's a demand for that knowledge. Those students need to get those degrees so that they become architects, right? Um, that is the worst thing you can do in the new economy. The worst thing you can do is to be hard to get into, right? Because higher ed is going to get flattened by platforms if, if I think these guys are right. Um, think about the profession. We make it difficult, really hard to get into the profession. It's a, that's a dumb thing to do, right? And so I would say that you know, every organization or profession that thinks of itself as a gatekeeper where there's asymmetries of knowledge and a demand have got to reimagine themselves as platforms. So my center at my university, a lot of centers at university I call self-centered because there's usually some egomaniac who running the center and telling all the grad students what to do. Uh, you know, I said that is not sustainable. So I run my center like a platform. So I have practitioners, community members, I have a doctor, I have a public health physician, I have public policy people on my platform. It's in the College of Design and the School of Architecture, but we have a lot of different people coming to work on urban issues on a platform. It's kind of a mini experiment in what higher ed might, I think, have to become in the 21st century, which is an open platform for anybody interested in a topic who can contribute to that topic. Um, this is another one. We heard Doug Kelbaugh talk a bit about Jeffrey West and his book on scale, which is a fabulous book, and there's a lot in there about cities. So if you're interested in those issues, he, he, ends, uh, uh, he ends his book with this graph, and I won't go into it too detailed, except to say that he, like, he is also aware of these exponential spikes, and he said that if we don't do things to tamper them, like this curve of number one, we have a collapse like number two. And so what we have to do is this third red line is the curve of innovation, which is that the way to um, change uh, these, this kind of uh, exponential spike and collapse scenario is to actually innovate. So we have to innovate, but he also makes the argument that the time frame for innovation keeps getting shorter and shorter. So we have to innovate faster and faster because we keep stressing systems to the point of collapse, right? And so um, this, I think, is part of an argument that one of the ideas behind the new economy is that we have to continually innovate. We, and we have to be open to paradigm shifts. And again, this is a call to all of us. 
I would argue that we are actually really good at this. This is what we really are teaching in our schools of architecture and design, is to reframe, re-examine uh, from other perspectives, um, and, and being open to kind of paradigm shifting moments. Um, um, this is a, another inf uh, book that's influenced me is uh, Nassim Taleb's book on anti-fragility. We talk a lot in our fields about sustainability and about resilience, but he argues that what we actually have to learn from nature is the anti-fragile nature of nature. Uh, an example is our own brain. Our brain is an anti-fragile organism. In other words, as we have experiences in our life, our brain actually gets stronger. We get better because we have our experiences, right? The natural world isn't just resilient, it actually gets stronger in by adaptation to outside events, right? And so how could, what would, a, what would an anti-fragile built environment look like? In other words, what would that look like where we stop thinking about the built world as somehow different from the natural world, but actually operating the way the natural world does in a kind of anti-fragile way? There's a great chapter in this book called The Office Building and the Sook, and he compares office buildings to medieval sooks. And he thinks, you know, we think all these office buildings are strong and big, and these are the most vulnerable, the most fragile things we've ever built. He imagines, you know, you, take, you cut the power in one of these buildings, we all have to leave, right? The elevator doesn't work, the power doesn't work, we can't occupy these buildings unless everything is working perfectly. While the medieval sook, uh, the, these marketplace, um, the, there's a part of his, his chapter where he talks about how in Syria they were bombing the sooks in Aleppo and the sook was still operating. They were still like serving coffee in the sook while bombs were dropping on it, right? In other words, it's an incredibly anti-fragile built environment. And so I, I make the argument that um, we need to think about what that anti-fragility would look like in, in the, the things that we design. Um, and they are distributed, they're network, they have lots of semi-autonomous parts that are actually strengthened by stress rather than made vulnerable by stress. Um, and we, we have to recognize that we are in a period of uh, dis disruptions that will force this on us. Another person, Daniel Pink, who makes the argument that we have a uh, educational system that uh, takes us from um, uh, we're all born very creative, uh, little kids. Uh, I have two grandchildren, they're incredibly creative on the playground, you watch them. And we go through an educational system that makes us knowledgeable but drums out all of our creativity so that we feel embarrassed by it. In fact, I think one of the interesting phenomena in our field is when students come into colleges like ours, they have to sort of relearn what it felt like to be a kid again. To, to, to relearn that sense of play that actually is the source of creativity. And, and Daniel Pink argues is that we have to have an educational system that moves people to this upper right quadrant. How can you be knowledgeable but also creative? And I would argue that that is one of the core skills of designers, is that we have a discipline, a set of disciplines, that allows us to be knowledgeable but also creative. And as Pink argues, the world desperately needs people in this quadrant, right? So how can our, our pedagogy and the way we work and think become a model for education? So this idea of effective creativity. And how do we uh, make that happen throughout an organization? So, you know, this new economy is a profoundly non-hierarchical economy. This is not about command and control. This is about distributed networks of people, all of whom are contributing creatively um, to what is needed. Uh, this is something I also wrote in that book that I showed at the beginning, is that um, we have, a, as a design community, a really terrible time explaining the logic of what we do. And uh, we all learn in school about induction and deduction, the mathematical and scientific methods, and we don't think enough or talk enough about the third logic that Aristotle talked about, which is called abduction, which I argue is exactly what we do, which is what we learn how to do as designers is how to make lateral leaps among things that are seemingly unconnected, right? That's that paradigm shifting way of thinking that is a form of logic. It isn't some heroic genius that has a light bulb that comes off. It's actually something that the brain is pretty good at doing um, and that we should um, talk about what we do as being rigorous and being as fundamental as science and math. Um, 
And so um, this is where, you know, this kind of idea of the way in which design thinking is increasingly in demand. Uh, I, I certainly see this in universities where all the other fields are coming to us saying, you know, how do you guys think? How do you work? You know, they don't want a building. They want an epistemology, right? And we need to be clearer about our epistemology, how we think. And then Tom Friedman's book, recent book, he talks about the acceleration uh, revolution, the fact that, you know, technology is moving faster than our ability to adapt. And this idea that we have to recognize that we're in the midst of these three great accelerations. He calls them the three M's. I think he's, he's from Minnesota, so maybe he had the three M on, on the mind, but he talks about the market acceleration with the digital world, Mother Nature's acceleration with climate change and Moore's Law, the acceleration of uh, increasing technology. And how do we develop organizations and professions that can be adaptable uh, to these rapid uh, accelerations going on? So those are a quick tour of six books that I thought would frame the way in which I want to talk about the economy, about, uh, you know, to give you a sense of the context so that as we talk about redesigning the economy, and I'll talk about some projects that we have underway that shows specifically what I mean, um, I thought that this would be some maybe useful background. So uh, before I do that, though, I just add this, I also want to just put a little bit, like, why have we ignored this? What, you know, why has our, our discipline, our set of disciplines, somehow not paid an attention to this largest part of our, our economy? I mean, this is, I talk about this in a book that came out this year. Um, and, uh, you know, partly it's because I think we are um, very wedded to the old economy, uh, which is very much about capital accumulation. I think we don't always realize that, um, that buildings are a, a place where uh, people globally are parking money. Um, I have an excerpt from my book that's in Architect Magazine this month where it's one of the more controversial chapters. I also talk about the amount of money laundering that has driven the architectural community, and where whole parts of cities like Dubai have basically been money laundering machines, right? And uh, maybe it's not coincidental I picked this building, um, <laughs> because that has also happened in the US, that we have seen you know, developers in the US money launder. Um, and so, you know, we have to acknowledge that we've been complicit in this, maybe not intentionally, but we are perceived by people as being complicit in this. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I'm in community meetings where people will say, oh, you architects, I thought you just did things for the rich and the powerful. You know, why are you here? I mean, you know, so their image of us is that we are wedded to this kind of a thing, which I actually think is a, a bad thing to be wedded to, especially in the new economy. I also think this is a book by one of my professors, Colin Rowe, who made the argument that we also are a profession that has tended to think that if you have good intentions, that's all you need to have. I mean, the, the outcomes can be terrible as long as you have good intentions. He argued that modernism suffered from this, that, you know, Mies and Korb and Wright, they all were well-intentioned. You know, it could have been a, it, you know, a lot of it was a disaster, right, for cities, especially, right? I have a colleague at Boston University that just wrote about um, IIT's development and how much of South Side Chicago was demolished for that campus, right? So we talk about Mies, and it's, you know, it's a lovely campus, but we also don't talk about the consequences of those good intentions that, um, uh, Mies had. So um, we've, as a result of that, we've been, I, I would argue, overly idealistic. That uh, we have not been, even though we are at one level a very practical discipline, I mean, we put buildings together and whatever, but basically our thinking has been extremely idealistic, that our good intentions are all that matters. Um, and so um, I also think that we uh, t talk a lot, but we don't do enough. I mean, this is just some of the, um, uh, you know, sort of visualizations of carbon accumulation. This is, um, I think this is uh, uh, one day of uh, carbon accumulation, maybe it's one week. It's either one day or one week of carbon accumulation on Manhattan Island if it was in balloons of one ton of carbon. So each one of these blue balls is one ton of carbon, right? And that's either one day, I think it may be one week, but this is one year 
of carbon on Manhattan, right? Um, and uh, so, I mean, I always thought it was paradoxical that we, you know, at the last AIA convention, we're passing all this really great, you know, resolutions about climate change sitting in an air-conditioned windowless convention center in Las Vegas and not critiquing about, well, where are we doing this and what is this place that we're doing this in? I mean, are we crazy, you know? And so I think we also have to get beyond not only just being well-intentioned, but we have to stop just talking and we actually have to start doing in uh, reframing uh, actions. Um, and so what would those be? So I thought I'd run through a series of projects that we're doing um, in my center um, or that we're involved in in some way as, a, as sort of examples of what a uh, economic redesign process might look like. And I'll, I thought I'd divide this into microeconomics and macroeconomics. Um, and uh, some of what you'll see is um, part of an ongoing research effort that we have with, with the, many of the major architectural firms in the Twin Cities. We have a MS and research practice degree where students are placed into firms uh, to do research of value to the firms uh, in partnership with a faculty member. So it's a firm school partnership and uh, the students uh, work on projects, as I said, that are not only relevant to that particular firm, but everybody in the consortium has to share the knowledge. So all of the firms sit around together and they share what each other's learning. And that was at first a, a really a sticking point for a lot of firms. It's like, well, we don't want to tell our competitors. But what they've now found is that, in fact, everybody benefits. It's, it's, we're trying to change the culture of our profession from being like a trade that keeps trade secrets to become a profession that shares knowledge. And professions are open about knowledge rather than keeping it in. And so some of these projects are some of the uh, outcomes of, of that. And you know, I, I asked the firm, I said, there's one firm in particular, I said, do you mind me talking about this? They say, no, I mean, this is the idea, is that they actually want this knowledge to be shared as widely as possible. So on the map, uh, the, but um, uh, let me just start here. So. Um, I do think that um, even in our day-to-day um, -day practices in architecture, we can start to think about system change. This is the house that my wife and I just finished and moved into a month or so ago. And, you know, it's in the center of the Twin Cities. Um, but it, it burns no carbon and is uh, off the grid. In fact, it's, well, I, it's part of the grid because it generates way more power than we use. So um, we're basically part of the electrical grid now. And, um, and I would argue that that should just be standard practice. That from this moment on, we don't do any buildings that burn carbon, and we don't do any building that isn't generating at least the power it needs as well as being part of the grid. I mean, it's sort of like, at what point do we stop talking and we just say, this is the, the expected standard and this is what we're all going to do from this moment on, right? I mean, the, the power of that is professions have a lot of power to fundamentally change systems by simply acting differently, by refusing to uh, continue to cater to the carbon economy, to the old economy, and to say that this is simply what it means to be an architect now. Um, uh, it doesn't have to look as weird and kind of strange as that, but it, you know, it needs to function that way, right? You know? um, uh, so, but let me also, I, I put some slides in, because one of the other systems that we're working on is our transportation system, and I, I wasn't going to show these, but I think we've talked so much about that, I, I, I thought I would share a little bit of this. So we've been working on two National Science Foundation grants on the impact of autonomous vehicles on our infrastructure and our cities, on our streets, our parking. And um, I'll just show a few slides. I, I just presented this earlier this week to congressional staffers. So Congress is quite interested in. So a lot of the staffers who look at transportation issues are following this, trying to think about what the policy issues are. But um, the point here is that 100 years ago, we took an animal out of our transportation system, which was the horse, and we went from horses to cars because cars were cheaper, safer, and cleaner than horses. And that happened in a 20-year span, a time frame that was also interrupted by World War I. 
um, we went from there being in you know 1900 no cars to being in 1920 early 20s no horses right and I make the argument that we are going through that same transition again we're taking another animal out of the transportation system which is all of us because driverless cars are cheaper safer and cleaner when we're not behind the wheel right um, and so, and we are going to be removed from vehicles uh, quickly, certainly within a 20 year period, probably faster because our economy works faster than it did 100 years ago. And so what does that mean? And I'm really interested in what that means for cities and for communities. Um, so, um, you know, the, we've all read about autonomous vehicles. To me, the, the most important word on this slide is the word shared, because these are not going to be vehicles that we own the car manufacturer's model is that they are going to make them, they're going to continue to own them, and they're going to offer us mobility. So talk about a paradigm shift. They realize that they're not car companies, they're mobility providers, right? And that's, their, that's what people are paying, that's what we really want. We want to get from point A to point B. If there's a faster, cheaper, cleaner way to do that, we're all going to jump on that, right? And that, that is their intention, and they are moving as fast as possible in that direction because it's more profitable for them and it's much less costly for us. In fact, so much less costly that the model that Waymo, the Google company, is thinking is that if we're willing to sit in one of these vehicles and look at a little TV screen with advertising, the ride is free. So, you know, so I would, you know, we might still have a right to go out and buy a $35,000 car, but you get a better experience for free. So take your choice. In other words, what happens with paradigm shifts like this is that the economics are overwhelming, that these are revolutions because they, you simply can't compete in the old model because the new model is so powerfully um, um, persuasive in terms of its impact. But one of the other things, and this is where it gets down back to us in the built environment, one of the other things that's been kind of amazing is that these vehicles operate totally differently than we do as drivers. When we drive, we drive all over the road, and so we have to have continuously paved streets and curb and gutters and storm sewers. That road system that we've had for 100 years, well, it turns out that that road system doesn't work with this new technology because these vehicles are so precise they, they as repetitive where they take the same path every time. And so within a matter of a few weeks, we're watching roads starting to rut, which is interesting because that's exactly what happened when cars used to ride on roads that had been ready for horses, as the cars were rutting these old horse uh, conditioned roads. And so we are going to have to rethink our infrastructure. But what's interesting about the potential of that is that once we do, uh, once we realize that all we need for roads are reinforced concrete grade beams where the tires go, is the rest of the road becomes pervious. It can be grass, it can be gravel, which has a huge impact on water. In other words, instead of a storm sewer system, you can retain the water in the roadbed. It also, the lanes get narrower, you have many fewer lanes because it's a shared system. So there's a lot more space in the public right of way for other kinds of activities, which is what we're starting to look at. What does that landscape look like and what are those opportunities? What's needed for roads and what's available for bikes and pedestrians and scooters? And then we've been looking at sort of standard um, um, intersections and looking at sort of the awkward transition. We will go through a transition where there'll be, and in fact we're already there, there are nearly autonomous vehicles. They still have drivers behind them, but they have almost all the technology out on the road now. There will be, a, there'll be an awkward phase as there was when we had cars and horses on the roads together, but these systems don't tend to work together very well, so I would predict that within 20 years you won't be allowed to drive in Chicago. Um, you might still be able to own a car, it will be expensive, it will be like owning a horse. Uh, and you're, you may have an autonomous vehicle that takes you out to the country where you get in your car and you can probably drive it around in the country as you can a horse but you'll have to give it up because you can't bring a horse into the city, you can't bring drivers into the city, and that'll be uh, probably two decades. Um, so also, you know, there's all sorts of land use implications. About 30% of our land is devoted to parking cars in a shared system. There's very little parking because these car companies want these vehicles to be running day and night because that's how they make money. So they'll be moving people in the day and packages at night. 
Uh, and so you, we all need to start thinking now about how to, does everything that we're doing to accommodate cars have a second use to a second life, right? So this is a big system change that's happening in transportation, which means a big system change in the built environment for us uh, with a lot of other kinds of opportunities for development. How do we start to think about policies that uh, get private property owners who have big surface parking lots to think about um, incentives to build affordable housing or to meet other kinds of needs that we have. Um, and so that's where I think our field also needs to think in terms of incentives, in terms of what are the opportunities here that um, private property owners might not see um, that uh, we can help them recognize as being possible. Uh, anyway, so that's, um, <clears throat> so there, those are two examples, the, the house and this infrastructure work, which is about system design in still the physical world. Now I want to sh uh, skip to, um, oh, and by the way, this is how we're envisioning um, the hyd hydrological role that will change, which is that instead of a storm sewer, curb and gutter system, that we envision that surface parking lots, one role they may play is a series of constructed wetlands. So for big rain events, you simply have a series of these open spaces that allow us to retain the water and uh, recharge the aquifer. Um, but so let me jump now to the uh, next body of work. So this is the, the next two projects are work that we did in partnership with HGA, which is a, a, a firm uh, it's around the country, their biggest office is in Minneapolis, and it's part of our research practice. This was a project done by Alejandra Cervantes, who now works at Mass Design in Boston. And um, what we were interested in was um, the idea of what is the impact of the new economy on architecture? And how, how can architecture be more engaged in this new so-called sharing, peer-to-peer, on-demand economy? This, distributed, networked economy that you know the, some of the people in those books that I was just talking about are envisioning. Um, and the, what is the overlap between architecture and economic development? The idea here is that we tend to be perceived as a profession that just is expensive. That we, we're, you know, we, we require a lot of money, buildings are really expensive things, and we don't think enough about how our work is actually a possible economic development strategy. In other words, it isn't what we need, it's what we can do that can actually fuel the local economy wherever we build. So what we did is um, HGA was working on a clinic in a little city in the coast of Oregon called Lincoln City. And this was a city that used to have a wood products industry that was now largely defunct. But they still had a lot of the built infrastructure and they had a lot of the human assets of people who had still worked in that industry. So the question we raised was how could in designing and specifying and building this clinic, could we restart the wood products industry in Lincoln City? In other words, through our decision making, we don't just build them a clinic, we restart their economy. Uh, and interestingly enough, you can guess why uh, HGA got that job, because other firms came in and said, yeah, here's all the clinics we, we do, and HGA said, yeah, here we can do clinics, but we also we will we'll restart your economy for you. And in other words, you know, by doing research, by understanding these bigger trends, it becomes overwhelmingly attractive to clients and communities to want to engage with us because it's not just buildings they're getting, they're getting paradigm shifting ways of thinking about the impacts we can have. And so uh, we developed a whole local economy model here where there were um, uh, outputs, uh, in other words, by the decisions we made in this clinic, you know, how, how would it affect the community? How would it benefit the factories that were defunct? How could we re reopen some of the logging that had, had ended? What is the social and financial capital? How could, what role could the government play? In other words, this was viewed as part of the architectural project, which was thinking about how the economy might work differently in this region. Um, and with diagrams that we were showing their um, economic development personnel in Oregon who had never thought about economic development this way. In other words, one of our other skill sets is helping people envision, visualize things. And this ability to diagram and to show these kind of loops 
uh, was itself a kind of transformative thing. It's led the state of Oregon to sort of reimagine what economic development might be and actually involve designers more often. Um, and so we looked at, uh, you know, uh, material downsizing, uh, downcycling, material upcycling. How could, you know, again, specifications um, use uh, recycle uh, assets that were already there? And how could the building be designed so that it could be deconstructed and repurposed uh, to keep it out of the waste stream? Um, this idea of a sharing economy where we were thinking, you know, as we worked uh, with that community, uh, it turns out that a lot of people don't want to go to clinics. We heard this from uh, mothers, particularly. It's like, if I've got a sick kid, the last place I want to go with my kids cause I, is to the clinic, because my, then my healthy kid is also going to get sick because I'm bringing the healthy kid in with all the sick kids, right? So maybe for certain populations, it's a distributed model where the clinic goes to you rather than you come to the clinic. And so they actually realized the clinic could be smaller. Uh, which saved the client money and they helped them think about a new distributed model for the delivery of uh, some of the uh, what they had thought would be in in the building itself and then uh, we were also looking at again this economic development stream the role of the developer uh, nonprofits how the state could help one of the other things is interesting about this is this started to tap other pots of money in the state like workforce development you know like economic development funds that would never have been applied to a clinic in a small town but this was a much bigger project than a clinic it was a whole uh, strategy and so I, I want to make the case that this is what architecture looks like in the new economy. And this is the scope and the opportunities that we have, is longer term engagements with communities that help make their lives better uh, and listens deeply to what their needs are rather than simply saying, okay, here's a building, we delivered the building and take our photos and be gone. Uh, and we, we started to actually map where all the materials are coming from, where typically the materials would have come from, and then how we could, um, we were looking at where the quarries were, where the, you know, uh, uh, wood resources were. We had to go as far as Montana for some things, but, you know, we kept it relatively within that region. So it was, a, it was also a regional multi-state economic development strategy. And so this idea, what is the impact of architecture, we argue is way beyond the building. Um, and the users of the building, they're, they're still obviously really important, but that uh, our impact is potentially much greater. And how could this be an ongoing methodology for our profession as we think about this? You know, in other words, how can we have, go beyond the relatively limited impact we have on employment, which are the construction jobs that we create, to actually um, having a long-term impact on a local economy. So every building is an opportunity to restart and re-employ people who have skills that aren't being leveraged. Um, and that led to the second project, which was um, uh, by Pratiba uh, Sh Shuhan, who's now joined Perkins and Will in their strategy group. Um, and uh, again, we did this with HGA. Uh, and we started to uh, look more broadly at how practice services will change in the sharing economy. So the Lincoln City project was the impact of a building on a local economy. We started to ask ourselves, well, what is the nature of architectural practice in this new economy? So that was the question we were looking at with this research. And so Pratiba did a whole sort of, um, uh, sort of diagram of the, uh, 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 of the different aspects of the sharing economy. In other words, it's not a single thing, it's actually several distinct kinds of activities. Um, and we began to riff on what are the um, uh, uh, practice implications in the AEC world for all of these. Um, and and uh, she started to, again, diagram different companies. Um, and um, a lot of this is based on the idea that in the 20th century, we overproduced almost everything. We have, uh, you know, that Uber and Lyft realized uh, that there were too many empty seats being driven around in cars that were underutilized. Uh, Airbnb realized there's too many empty beds sitting around unused, right? And the idea of the sharing economy is how do we squeeze out the overproduction and overcapacity of the 20th century economy and n enable every consumer to be a producer, enable every asset to be a source of revenue generation for people. 
Um, and we think that this is an enormous opportunity for us, that we have been complicit in overproducing space. Um, we write on our plans that this, this room has that function, and we think, okay, that's the only function this room can have, as opposed to helping clients think about what's every possible function that could happen in this room? How could you utilize this space as much as possible? Rather than making spaces exclusive, they become inclusive um, because we believe that that's what the sharing economy is going to drive all of us to do. We have to stop building so much and we have to be much more creative in using what we've got um, and developing new practice models that enable us to do that. Um, so these were just some of the diagrams of, of um, different companies and how they uh, align on, on the different forms of the sharing economy, how we, would metric, how we would measure that, and the implications. And I'll just run through a few of them. You know, the gig economy, the idea of companies like Freelancer. Or, you know, um, so what does the gig economy look like in architectural practice, right? What is the virtual firm? The gig economy would suggest that we wouldn't have big offices of permanent employees, that we would have probably smaller offices with a lot of people who uh, ideally have health benefits, um, but that who can come in and out of projects, that the, the firm of the future may be one that is much more about uh, alliances among um, people who have uh, multiple practices going on um, as, as one model. Um, the on-demand economy, I mean, what would on-demand architecture look like? Right? I mean, we know what Netflix and Spotify have been able to do. We, again, we have a kind of gatekeeper model, a very 20th century model of practice. But what would it mean that, you know, we charge by the hour? I mean, some people may only need an hour's worth of consulting from a firm, right? So why don't we offer, you know, charging by the hour? Why, you know, are there ways that we can engage people who could never afford architects given our current practice model, but we make ourselves much more affordable and accessible by thinking about different ways of being available on demand. Um, cr uh, a crowd economy, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, how can we uh, utilize uh, this idea of the wisdom of the crowds in our work? I don't know if, if any of you have seen this series that Lisa Saunders, the Yale doctor, is doing called diagnostics where she deals with medical conditions that nobody can figure out and so she puts it out to the world. She says, okay, here's a set of symptoms, who has an idea? And they have been able to solve incredible medical issues by crowdsourcing the ideas. So what would a crowdsourcing of design look like? And how might we, in fact, instead of you know, viewing the client as this, just this person we're serving in the community that we have to you know, go to to get input, that in fact they're involved with us in coming up with ideas, that there's a new mechanism by which we uh, engage them so that every building is a learning opportunity. It's not just a thing but it's a way for people to sort of reimagine themselves and, and, um, and, and, and to value their ideas. Uh, the idea of collaborative consumption. You know, this is this idea of what are we, how do we help our clients with their existing buildings reimagine all the different ways those spaces could be used. I mean, every time there's a building that is sitting empty is an underutilized asset, is a waste of resource. I mean, I talk about that a lot in our city. We have office buildings, heated, lit, guarded, and fully serviced, and we have homeless people sitting outside. I mean, it's insane. And we say, well, you have no place for them. I say, what do you mean you have no place for them? You have a 40-story building right there. I mean, let's figure out a model that would enable us to get everybody sheltered, everybody uh, out of the cold. Um, you know, those are the strategies that we bring enormous value to, I think. Um, and this idea of peer-to-peer, -peer, this notion that um, we have a lot of peer judgments. I mean, we just had peer uh, evaluations of the projects. So we do peer-to-peer -peer kinds of analyses within our field, but what about peer-to-peer -peer kinds of connections to larger publics? I mean, what would that look like? And, um, um, and so again, this idea of thinking of our profession and our organizations more like platforms that are open to people being parts of platforms, being, uh, being able to interact with us, and being able to um, offer uh, their kinds of advice. And then this idea of a, you know, a kind of a, a collaborative uh, economy as well. 
which is um, you know, helping clients, for example, think about strategies where they can rent out space or make revenue off of their projects. So we're not just this cost to clients, we're actually a strategist with clients to think about how they can generate new kinds of revenue. Um, so we've, we've been also doing research on examples. This is a transportation example. We've been starting to look at rural transportation from a sharing economy mode where we've been going to these small towns and mapping all of the cars that are sitting around and all of the trips that everyone needs to make and then linking them together to say, okay, here's a network of people that have a, an asset, here's a network of people that have a need, and we put them together. And um, so this idea of building local networks uh, around the economy based on physical assets. Uh, the hospitals are starting to do this, so um, this is also part of that research that HGA and the, and the, and the university are doing. So those are some um, uh, micro uh, uh, opportunities. Let me just, um, I hope I have, I'm covering a lot of territory here, so I'll keep going. S okay, so macroeconomics. So, um, uh, so behind a lot of this is this series, this is sort of how I think about the paradigm shift that we're going into. And maybe the most important one is the first one, which was we have built our entire economy around scarcity. The dismal science is about scarcity, you know, and about um, a few people owning assets and nobody else having access to that, right? It turns out that there is no other economy in nature that operates that way. Nature does not work on a deficit basis, it works in an abundance mentality, right? We know that there's as much solar energy hitting the planet, I think, in a day to meet our needs, current needs for a year. We're not out of energy, we just haven't captured all the energy that is free coming at us, right? So the, nature is abundant, and because, but we've had a scarcity mindset for several hundred years. Um, and so what happens, and I believe that what this economy doing, is doing is flipping the model. That those who still think about uh, you know, scarcities, or those who go into communities and think about, oh, those poor people, look at all the things they lack. I mean, we work a lot with people experiencing homelessness. We have a lot to learn from them. I don't look at them as being in deficit. I look at them as having incredible assets, because you know what, those people, they can, they can survive on almost nothing. I mean, I'm amazed at how they put their lives together. And so we need to learn from them. Their, what are their assets? You know, what are their networks? How do they manage to, to put lives together? Because I think that those are strategies that we could all um, benefit from. We're moving to distributed systems. We're moving to a relational economy from a transactional one, from a command and control notion of organization to human-centered organizations should meet the needs of everybody in that organization. And if, you're not, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing the, the, a, a good enough job. And this idea that we're moving away from a mechanistic model to an ecological model. Um, so these are mindset shifts that are part of a, another project we're doing, which is on the future of work. And I'll just quickly go through this. Um, we've been working with a group of sociologists and economists uh, in a number of universities that are starting to look at the impact of automation on work. And one of the things, this is sort of a founding paper that came out of Oxford, and there's some 700 some categories of work, and they estimate that about half of those are extremely vulnerable to automation. Anything that is predictable or dangerous is rapidly being automated. And what's interesting to me about this is who's on the list. This is not just blue collar work, this is like medical diagnosis. I mean, this is like accounting. In other words, there is a lot of white collar work that is going to be rapidly automated. And so what I've focused on, you know, again, I tend to look at what's the opportunity rather than the problem. So I've been looking at which are the, the other half that are not vulnerable to automation. And I think of them as the six C's, right? And so um, I'll just go through some of this. Um, so here are some of the, the jobs that are on this list. You know, the repetitive, predictable work that are rapidly being automated. And of course, we've seen this in our own practices. Think about, uh, you know, all of the jobs that have disappeared through automation from secretaries to a lot of our contract documents, specifications. There's whole sets of things that have happened in our world that have also been predictable and automated. Um, 
and then dangerous activities. But, so let's look at what the things that are left, because what's key about this is the role that this, the design community plays in the jobs that are, are more resistant, very resistant to automation. Um, so I said the six C's. One area of work that is very resistant to automation is caring work. In other words, uh, work that we, we do for each other. Uh, another area is a lot of communications jobs. In other words, the things that are resist automation are, are things that are about human to human interactions, whether it's physically caring for somebody, whether it's communicating. Of course, these are all part of practice, all parts of running uh, organizations. Craft work. In other words, one of the things that uh, humans are much better at than, uh, than automation is actually creating something that's unpredictable, that um, involves manual dexterity, dexterity. Creative work, I mean, this is obviously our kind of sweet spot, right? Is that, you know, the jobs, including designers that, uh, and architects are, yeah, there's architects, engineers. In other words, um, the idea of imagining something that doesn't yet exist as well as, interestingly enough, construction jobs. Um, that manual dexterity, particularly on the job site, is very difficult to automate. To have ro we'll have robotics on construction sites, but for fairly limited kinds of activities. And then finally, community work. And so when you think about those six Cs, I think, I think almost all of them are wrapped up in an architectural and design practice, right? So I think as a field, we are relatively resistant to automation, but we have to realize that we're designing buildings and environments for people who are going through a lot of disruption. And this disruption is going to be happening in a matter of decades, right? And so thinking about what a future economy is that's based around caring, communication, craft, creativity, construction, and community work is, I would argue, the future of work. It's what we will all be doing most uh, mostly in the near future. And what's interesting to me is that this is the pre-industrial economy. In other words, one way to think about this moment that we're in right now is that we have gone through a couple hundred years of slowly automating all the things that people are not good at. And we are left with the things that we used to do before the steam engine, before mechanization. We're left with a pre-industrial, now high-tech, economy, right? And um, so I make this point because, again, I think our fields can play a leadership role in what that would look like. Um, and to think about the environments we're creating in terms of what's left to us once computers are doing all the things that we either are not very good at uh, or that are dangerous for us. So that's one kind of macroeconomic thing. And I think I'll end with this. So this, this really takes it out to maybe kind of the outer limits of what you know, we might do as designers. So I've been approached by a group of economists and we're working on a book. And uh, they, it was interesting, they wanted a designer working with them. Not just to, I mean, I'm not designing the book. I'm sort of thinking through this with them. So their idea is that we have this uh, cryptocurrencies uh, called Bitcoin, right? And they're very critical of cryptocurrencies because they say this is all about speculation. There's no social justice. There's no social benefit to cryptocurrencies. It's just people speculating on the value. And they argue that's a 20th century way to think about cryptocurrencies. Um, what they're interested in is how do we compensate people for all the unpaid value related labor that we all do? raising kids, taking care of elderly parents, volunteering at you know, your church, your synagogue. I mean, all of the things we do, volunteering for your professional organization, sitting in rooms like this, listening to somebody like me talk. I mean, all of this is, they argue, incredibly value-creating stuff for which none of us get paid. And they say that is a market failure and that is a flaw in our economy. And so they're, they're determined to take Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and apply it to social benefit and basically compensate us through this thing called Scrip um, so that we would get paid in Scrip for all of the volunteer work, the value added work we do in communities, right? And, um, but what's interesting to me about this is um, 
uh, so they have this idea, so they had that idea, but what, what's fascinating is they made this other uh, kind of abductive leap because they also recognized that we have a lot of underutilized assets. I realize that that's why I'm involved because they were reading the stuff I was writing about you know, all of the empty rooms and all of the empty car seats and all of the empty underutilized assets. And they realized that these two things are connected because they said, think about all of the empty seats in theaters. Think about all of the empty seats in restaurants. Think about all of the empty space that is not being utilized. And so their proposal is that we have a, another currency so that we would get paid in cash for some things, we'd get paid in script for all our uncompensated work, and that we would um, uh, help uh, asset owners fully utilize their assets by being paid partly in cash and partly in script. And so it would be a double bookkeeping, double currency idea. So their argument is in the new economy, we need a way for us to be fully paid and fully employed. They also have a full employment idea that there's so much work out there and if the cash economy isn't ready to pay people to do all the work, that the script economy will fully employ everybody. That there, will, there should be nobody who is uh, willingly unemployed. Uh, you know, un I mean unwillingly unemployed. People who are willingly unemployed may be, but you know, most people are unwillingly unemployed, right? And so how do you make sure that everybody has a purpose, everybody is contributing to a community, and so there's a social justice piece to it. So let me just end by just saying that, um, you know, I think that um, we are in this incredible moment in time where we now have uh, a kind of mindset shift going on in the economy which is recognizing that we have all of this underutilized asset, all of this underutilized renewable resource that we never leverage, all of this uh, untapped human capital that we undervalue, and all of this uh, underutilized space that we have in our built environment. And uh, thinking about how all of those things go together so that we fully employ our people, our renewable resources, and our built environment to create the new economy, I think, is the great sort of opportunity before us. So with that and all the thunder, I think I'll say thank you. So I hope that wasn't exhausting. I just threw a lot at you, but. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So you talked about how we think uh, as architects when we solve problems. And yeah. It reminded me of an article I read some time ago in the Chronicle for Higher Education. Yeah. And it asked the question, is design thinking replacing liberal arts? I read that article. And how would you, how would you answer that question? I think design thinking isn't replacing uh, liberal arts, but I think it's a core skill. I, I co-teach a grand challenge course with colleagues from other departments. Uh, in the university and we take on, um, it's called global venture design. We basically teach students from all over the university about social entrepreneurship. And we've worked in India, Uganda, Nicaragua, we're now working in Puerto Rico. And um, they want me in that classroom. These are business professors, public policy professors. They want me in that classroom because they think, they're telling me that design thinking is a core skill in the 21st century that if you do not know how to deal with the ambiguity, with the innovation, the creativity that we all sort of take for granted, they feel that the students aren't gonna be prepared for this new economy. So I find that fascinating. I haven't told them that, they're telling me that. And so I think we're at this moment where there's been this recognition in the larger economy that the way we work and the way we think is, got, is a kind of a core skill. It doesn't mean that reading and math and science uh, are not. It just means that we actually are not this kind of marginal field that just sort of, oh, you guys, you just sort of, you know, you design your buildings and leave us alone to, no, 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 there's something in your epistemology and in your pedagogy that is fundamental. And I think that's a great message for us. We should listen to them. So, yeah. Thanks for a great talk and very uh, wide ranging. Um, how do you? T I was thinking about two things you said, and uh, how do you tie the current sort of patron-based model of like mm. institutions as well as like uh, structures? It's based on like wealthy institutions and, and families and households, and maybe governments, versus this more grassroots 
democratize, for lack of a better term, the economy? Are the same people who had a part in the first sort of thinking that, hey, maybe we have to change the ladder, or is it a totally different constituency that's calling for the ladder? Well, that's a great question. I, I don't have an answer, but let me try one. I mean, I do think there's a generational shift going on. I think there are people in power. We see this in Washington. There's a lot of people stuck in the last century that want to make America great again, you know, like go back to 1950. I mean, they are clueless clueless about what's actually happening in the world, right? So some of those people are just going to have to die or go to retirement home or go somewhere. They're going to have to leave because they are trying to take us backwards and the, the force of this economy is overwhelming, right? And uh, nature always wins and the economy always wins. And the politics of this country right now has never been at, at greater odds with the economy. I mean, 90% of our economy is in cities. We have hostility in Washington towards cities. I mean, it's insane that our federal government is hostile to 90% of its economy, right? So that is not sustainable, right? So there's a generational shift that has to go on. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, one of the roles I play in the Twin Cities, I'm often on architect selection panels where I'm on the client side listening to architects present. And I'm frequently the only design professional on that side. And so I find it fascinating to hear the conversations of clients after they've heard all these firms come and present their work. And two things about that. One, we all tend to sound alike, so that's a problem. Even I sometimes forget who said what, you know, and I know these people. But the other thing is that the ones, I find the firms that get these commissions are the ones who have uh, interesting insights that the client hadn't necessarily thought about. And frequently it's, it's raising questions about, well, you know, are there other opportunities here? You know, we see other potentials or other possibilities. Frequently clients will say, well, that's, the, the firm I want to commission because they're thinking about us in another way. They're thinking about our world in another way and opportunities. And so I think this mindset of, of constantly sort of thinking about how do we leverage assets, how do we create new opportunities for communities and for clients is also just the way to be successful now in addition to being successful in the future. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Remember how many people voted against it? Yeah. Like eight percent. Yeah. So there's still a lot of discrepancy out there, and there's right. a lot of people who don't agree about prioritizing energy and carbon. So what, how could we get that to the forefront? Yeah, and I don't think we'll ever convince everybody. I mean, there's always going to be people who will resist any change, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess the, one of the points I was trying to make is to just do it in your own work. I mean, just start. In other words, not wait for somebody. I don't think we can wait for a carbon tax. I mean, I think we just have to start acting as if there was a carbon tax, you know, and decarbonize our buildings just as a matter of this is standard practice that we don't even need to ask the client for that. That's just what we all hold each other accountable to do and, and or hold ourselves accountable to do, you know. I hate playing the cynic. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's very large architectural firms out there who complain about an energy model costing 14,000 bucks, which is like less than half a percent of your construction costs. Yeah. Like if you're not analyzing how your building's performing, how do you even do good? Really? You don't even know what you're doing. Yeah, well, this is also why I think this, uh, we need another kind of relationship between the profession and the schools. I mean, I think this research practice model has a lot of potential. I mean, think about all the schools you have here. And, you know, why aren't the schools doing that kind of research? And then sending it out to all the firms so that when clients question, well, you know, what the savings is going to be, that, that we actually have the, the research to back up our claims, that this may cost you more up front, but you're going to look at all of what you're going to save. You know, Ed Mazzaria gave a talk recently, and he talked about the, 
the, how much money we have saved clients by simply energy cons conservation. He was making the point that we never got compensated for any of that, right? We just did that, right? But we've saved clients billions of dollars, let alone had a positive impact on the planet. And so we need uh, better information about that, the value proposition of what we're offering and help clients understand that this is not some left-wing you know, conspiracy theory, that this is very practical. This is gonna save them money and their buildings will be more valuable. We need to do that research too. Um, so I think that we have to change higher ed to stop writing one more article about Lou Kahn and to start thinking about what is research that is actually asking real important questions now that is of benefit to the profession. Right. Not that I mean I like Lucan. Don't take that. You know, <laughs> but you get the point. Yeah. yeah. Um, you spoke a bit about utilization of buildings and like the creative use of them. I was wondering <clears throat> if you had any thoughts about how communities or cities can better utilize school buildings because most yeah. are like closed at like four or five years. Yep. And then also, do you have any suggestions for Chicago? We recently closed about fifty to one hundred schools that are now just sitting vacant. Yeah, great questions. And uh, I, um, my house is across from a junior high school, and I'm watching. Um, uh, you know, it's a it's a church. It's a temple on sa Saturday, and it's a church on Sunday, and it's a adult education center most of the evenings during the week. You know, so that building is humming like all the time. And so I mean, I but that's where the, you know again I think our profession has a role to play to creatively reimagine the space, right? So your schools are closed, but probably because of low enrollments or for cost reasons. But all of those are incredible assets. So what if the architectural community in Chicago went to the Chicago public school system and, and sort of showed them all of the ways that they could generate revenue and have community benefit for all these closed buildings? I mean, in other words, we need to be more socially entrepreneurial than we are. We, are wait, we wait too much to be commissioned and to be asked. We should sort of be presenting opportunities to the public. And um, so that's what I would do. I would see that as a huge opportunity for this community to reimagine what those closed schools uh, could be. Um, so go for it. <laughs> All right. Any others? All right, good. Well, I'll turn it over. Thank you.